mobile games. Holy God, what are you showing me? His head. Come on! Open your eyes! Marvel mobile games. Oh! Ew! Dude! What the fuck? All right, now you're just being dramatic. Among hardcore gamers, mobile games have had a negative connotation firmly tied to them for quite a while now. Sure, your mom is probably on her millionth level of Candy Crush, but come on. How many of you are really getting got by those convincing ads on TikTok for Whiteout Survival or that friggin' lava game? To be clear, I'm not shaming anyone that enjoys these kinds of games. You do you. Cut the shit out of that wood. But personally, these are just not my bag. They tend to prioritize monetization by having some sort of unfair handicap that incentivizes you to purchase their in-game currency using real money. And the gameplay mechanics take a backseat being very shallow. For example, Invincible's debut into the video game landscape is an experience whose main appeal is accruing currency. XP, gold bars, uh, another type of XP, all to just hit a button that makes your character stat screen go And sure, leveling up characters in a video game is a concept as old as time, but does it matter when the gameplay loop consists of this? The game is literally playing itself. It's a shame that this is what most people will think of when someone brings mobile gaming to the conversation, because smartphones are a totally viable platform for fully-fledged console-level video games. Games like Max Payne, KOTOR, and the PS2 GTA trilogy have been available to smartphones for a while now, and they run perfectly. And with the ability to pair just about any modern console controller through Bluetooth or accessories like the Backbone, well, we've come a long way from Snake. But what if I told you that there was a time when we were getting these kinds of console-like experiences on phones long before the mobile slop took over? I bet you recognize this logo. Gameloft, with over 200 games developed of all kinds of different genres. Racing, shooters, action-adventure, open world, these guys were the king of mobile games back in the early 2010s. See, during the flip phone era of mobile gaming, you'd get what I like to call the baby brother counterpart of the home console video game. This would most often be a side-scrolling platformer or beat-em-up, a top-down shooter if they were feeling really ambitious. And to be fair, these kinds of games were appropriate with the limited tech at the time, and you'd be surprised with some of the hidden gems you can find in the extensive list of Java games. But once smartphones were brought into the picture with their advanced technology, Gameloft sought out to develop more ambitious games that had home console elements like fully-fledged 3D graphics that are pretty damn impressive, narratives with voice-acted cutscenes, and full-range controls with, albeit a janky on-screen virtual analog stick. Even though Gameloft was cranking out varied video games like a well-oiled machine, they were often criticized for developing rip-offs of popular franchises. Gangstar, one of their more popular games, is an obvious GTA-inspired open-world crime game. Nova is their resident Halo stand-in, and Modern Combat is… well, do I need to say it? But here's the thing, I don't really think there's an issue with this. We've been getting clones of popular franchises since the 90s. Resident Evil clones, I mean the early 2000s were chock full of open world mafia games riding that massive wave the GTA game started. The term Doom clone is pretty much a genre in itself. I think ripoffs of better products is a necessary thing that makes the world go round, man. It's fun playing a cheaper, trashier version of a popular game. The open world in the Gangstar games feels hollow and empty, and the combat mechanics in most if not all of these games are pretty shallow. But the important thing is that Gameloft would charge you a one-time price for a complete package. No nickel and diming here to refill your energy meter that allows you to simply play the game. Unfortunately, this wouldn't be forever. With mobile games eventually switching to the freemium model, Gameloft had to adapt. Nowadays, their games are littered with the microtransactions I just finished ragging on, and it's a shame to see, because I think Gameloft was on the right track back in the early 2010s. So let's bring it back to that era, because there's a game I've always wanted to talk about. Gameloft also developed a number of licensed games, which you know is 100% my jam. 
Titles like Terminator Salvation, The Dark Knight Rises. D did you know that there was a Dark Knight Rises game? And the topic of discussion today, Ultimate Spider-Man Total Mayhem. Now, I know I'm probably tugging at your heartstrings right now because a lot of you kids might remember playing this forgotten gem on your mom's iPad. The sad truth is that Ultimate Spider-Man Total Mayhem has long been delisted from app stores. Yeah, another delisted Spider-Man game, who would have thought? But there are certain ways to play this game and I'm gonna be partaking in a bit of a taboo activity in order to do so. And you better not tell on me! So without further ado, let's take a trip down memory lane and play Ultimate Spider-Man Total Mayhem. Booting up the game will treat you to some panels from the Ultimate Spider-Man line of comics, cementing this game in the 1610 universe. Only not really, because the events of this game are not considered canon to the comics. So it's Ultimate Spider-Man in name and character designs only. And of course, there's that vibrant art style. It doesn't come anywhere as near as the PS2 Ultimate Spider-Man game to replicating that comic book aesthetic, but these low poly character models and non-existent facial animations are a feast for my retro loving eyes. Some of the animations are a little stiff and the environment's backdrops are very flat and obvious, but it's just so charming. It comes off to me as a late PS1 game and early PSP game. The game starts with Spidey on patrol as he comes across the Triskelion, a maximum security prison, set ablaze. Suspecting some of his supervillains to be on the loose, we spring into action and... Freak! Action is our reward, huh? And, well, I'm not complaining because, surprisingly, the combat in this game is pretty damn good. Now, I am playing with a controller, which I'm sure vastly improves the experience since you don't have to deal with finicky touch controls, so take that as you will. But, I was surprised with just how many attacks you can pull off here. You have a punch button, a web button, and a jump button. Spidey's basic punch combo has him unleashing a flurry of punches very reminiscent of an attack you can do in Web of Shadows. Holding down the jump button after a few punches will have you uppercut an enemy into the air where you can juggle him. You can also do a couple of different web based attacks like the iconic web strike, the web rodeo, and even a fucking sonic spin dash. You also have a special attack you can trigger whenever this web meter is topped off, which depletes whenever you use web attacks. I found that to be a little interesting, usually special attacks have their own little dedicated meter, so weighing the option of whether to use web based attacks or holding off so you can use your special attack was a mechanic to play around with. There's also a Spidey Sense counter attack button that has Spider-Man do this awesome side jump as he fires off a web shot to unsuspecting enemies with a slow-mo effect. Sometimes you can dodge multiple times in the middle of an already initiated dodge and it's kind of funny seeing Spider-Man defy the laws of physics and change the trajectory of his dodge in mid-air. Combat has that magnetization you can find in the Arkham games, so throwing a punch will automatically pull Spider-Man to whatever enemy he's facing, which is really mindful of the developers because a mechanic like this is really beneficial to a game where you're not actually supposed to be using a controller. So minimizing the need to be precisely lined up with whatever enemy you're trying to attack is an effective solution for awkward touch controls. There aren't any unlockable moves to speak of, but I didn't find that to be an issue here. I was perfectly satisfied with the amount of attacks at my disposal given the game's rough 2-3 hour runtime. And I think the combat is just kept entertaining with its bombastic animations and simplicity. Spider-Man has these really exaggerated animations that are fast, fluid, and have these satisfying wind-ups that make landing attacks feel impactful. After clearing up the first group of bad guys, we're ambushed by none other than Sandman atop a city bus. And we're treated to our first, oh yeah baby, you guessed it, a QTE. That's one trope checked off the list of obligatory ones in Spider-Man games. Sadly, they're not as hilarious as the ones found in Spider-Man 3 or even Web of Shadows, but they are very forgiving by comparison. Failing them still allows you to progress just with taking a minor hit to your health as a penalty. Continuing along, we pick up these red orbs that are used to upgrade your damage, defense, and special attack. 
You can find these simply scattered around levels, uh, beating up bad guys, causing property damage, or as we're about to do now, saving citizens. I love how the QTE for saving citizens is the same one from Ultimate Spider-Man on PS2. It makes me feel like this game is a spiritual successor. This simple side attack really adds a lot to mission design. Not only do they add to that essential feeling of being a superhero that is a must in Spider-Man games, but these hostages pretty much act as collectibles. Man, that sounds kinda derogatory when I say it out loud. But what I mean is that sometimes they're missable. You'll hear them screaming for help off screen, and because this game has a fixed camera angle, it's not always obvious where they're hiding away at. So you have to do a bit of exploration to find the little nook that leads to a hidden civilian. Sometimes you'll even find hidden paths that are more than just a simple nook, but entire areas that branch out to more enemies and platforming sections with a reward at the end. Like again, citizens to rescue or a collectible comic book cover, which is always a top tier collectible in comic book games. Sometimes when you reach a certain threshold in the level, you won't be allowed to backtrack, like it blocks you off, so it's very easy to miss these hidden areas. It's a little frustrating, but it adds replayability if anything, and incentivizes you to try out alternate paths on your second playthrough. For a simple linear brawler, level design is kept fresh because each level is always throwing some new wacky instance your way. Like the level where you're chasing after Rhino, there's this brief section where you're running up a ramp and the big guy is just chucking cars at you. There's no other place in the game where something like this happens, it is entirely exclusive to this level, and that's kind of the philosophy the rest of the game follows. Whether it be running across the Manhattan Bridge as it falls apart, running away from lasers in a Crash Bandicoot style camera angle, or grinding on power cables like your Cole McGrath, levels are kept varied and fun. There's even a very classic Spider-Man game chase sequence, complete with that little meter that lets you know how far away you are from your foe. That's another one off the list. As you might expect, there's no physics-based web swinging, or even the ability to continuously web swing. You can only do a single web swing, and it more or less functions as a double jump, or extended jump. Which I think is actually a big plus here. I criticize Spider-Man friend or foe for not utilizing the absence of proper web swinging as a way to bring in some precision based platforming. And this game does exactly that. Floating platforms, multi-layered platforms, and obstacle courses are plentiful and they are an absolute delight. Uh, I feel like again I have to bring up the fact that I'm playing this with a controller because if you were lucky enough to have to play this game with touch controls, you might be looking at me like I'm crazy. Web swinging is not completely absent in this game. There are these context sensitive swinging points in certain sections and they're really cool because they have the camera do this big swooping motion as it follows Spider-Man and because they're used relatively infrequently, they make these brief moments feel like, like, whoa! You know what I mean? Wall crawling is also very limited, you can't crawl up any wall you want, again instead there are these dedicated wall crawling sections where you have to avoid incoming hazards like falling furniture and fireballs. You might think it's weird for wall crawling to be so restricted in a Spider-Man game, but to me these dedicated sections are just another spice that keeps the overall experience fresh. So now that we're caught up to Sandman, it's time for our first boss fight. And it's a decent one to start with. Nothing incredibly complex or groundbreaking, it pretty much boils down to you mindlessly pummeling the walking pile of kitty litter. There are these water based hazards in the environment you can use against them, like this fire hydrant and a valve, but it's not at all necessary. Throughout the boss fight you'll occasionally be met with a brief prompt that lets you snap a picture. At first I thought that these would just generate a screenshot of the precise moment I managed to snap the picture. Instead, it's a preset image of the villain in an action-y pose that you can view in the extras menu. I thought it'd be more fun if it did in fact take a screenshot of when you managed to snap the picture so everyone can have a unique Kodak moment. They're crap. 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 Mega crap. That's pretty good. Once we're done sweeping up Sandman, we confirm that supervillains have in fact broken out of the Triskelion after the Rhino tosses a car at us. Man, he really likes to do that, huh? Of course, the boss fight with Rhino will have you playing Matador. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, I guess. 
This one spans across multiple stages, which I thought was pretty cool, at least for a mobile game of this time. After putting the rhino back in his cage, we overhear two cops talking about a large explosion in the local power plant. Oh, who could the culprit ever be? Insert shock pun. I want to take a minute to talk about Spidey's voice actor, Andrew Chaikin. He's performed in most Telltale games and has had a ton of roles in Star Wars games ranging from clone troopers, droids, and Boba Fett to name a few. He does a great job as Spidey here, he sounds somewhat similar to Sean Marquette from Ultimate Spider-Man, if a little more subdued. You know Sparky, with great power comes great- ah, uh, never mind. I need to turn your lights out for good. Which again, makes my headcanon place this game as a sequel to Ultimate Spider-Man. Would that work? I don't love Electro's voice here, no shame toward the actor, I just think that his voice is way too deep for the character. It teeters on becoming downright monstrous. Enjoy that punk. <laughs> I'd love to give you more, but I got a city to drain. Again, the boss fight here is serviceable. Electro will shoot out rotating lines of electricity that you have to avoid, and occasionally he'll regenerate his health, which you can stop by flipping a number of switches. It's nothing mind-blowing, but like I've been expressing, there's effort in making these bosses distinguishable by introducing a different gimmick for each one. Once his lights out for good old Maxwell, the 5-0 shows up and informs us that Roxxon has deployed security robots in charge of cleaning up any bad guys on the loose, and any further vigilantism from Spidey will be considered an offense. I just did 80% of your job, huh? That, that's how you pay me? I love these inconsistencies between Spidey's dialogue and what's happening in the cutscene. Like, he tells the cops to make sure to put on rubber gloves before cuffing Electro. Exactly what body do you think they'll be cuffing, Spider-Man? You just blew that guy up to the next dimension. There's also another part where it sounds like Spidey is addressing a group of people, but there's only one guy to be seen in the cutscene. Don't worry, folks. I'm gonna get you out of here. Good luck, fellas. I'll just hang out with these clowns until you fix them up. Are you having a stroke, man? Ah, symbiote invasion. Let me pull up the list. To be fair, I do really like the design of these symbiote-infected civilians. And hey, this is way more enemy variety than I was expecting. Between the everyday regular thugs, symbiote civilians, and even Roxxon security robots, this game far exceeded my expectations. I was surprised by how cinematic this level was at times. Bear with me, like, check out this cool transition from the rooftops of New York City into the open side of an exploded building all done within game mechanics. Or this Venom boss fight set atop a moving train with a slightly different camera angle. I don't know, maybe I'm overselling it, but I can't help but think that a lot of people just downloaded the free light version that only gave you access to the first level. Meanwhile, you have all these other levels that really try their damnedest to keep the experience interesting. And the team succeeds with flying colors. Like, uh, I downloaded this new Tomb Raider game on the App Store. I I've been really into Tomb Raider lately, ever since the remaster. Uh, so I downloaded this Tomb Raider game on my iPhone, and within 45 minutes of playing the game, I already got the gist of what the next thousand hours of this game would be like. You run through these levels as Lara automatically shoots any enemies nearby. Very simple controls, very minimal, which is fine. It's appropriate for a game that you'd play with one hand on the bus or as you wait in line. And every couple levels you get upgrades for your pistols and accrue resources. But then the game very quickly ramps up difficulty and then you die and you lose your upgrades. And you already know that you'll have to grind the same set of levels to pass that threshold. So you consider, eh, maybe I'll get a few bucks worth of these gems or whatever to give myself a leg up. And really, it's all just for a meaningless number. That's what these games are lately on the App Store, just increasing your numbers. Then you have Ultimate Spider-Man Total Mayhem, which has levels with thoughtful design, a story arc, even if it is a very simple one, and a combat system that, while not very deep, it still lets you experiment with different combos and, and they result in different attacks. It's a proper linear video game, very much comparable to Neversoft Spider-Man or the first Spider-Man movie game. And given the platform that it was exclusive to, I think it deserves that extra bit of praise. Anyway, here's Spidey awkwardly swatting away Venom's tendrils. Cut it I'm out, I'm not buddy. touching you! I'M NOT TOUCHING YOU! Stop. I'M NOT TOUCHING YOU! <laughs> stop it! I said stop! 
after we take out Venom, we learn that Norman is holding citizens and the mayor hostage at a baseball stadium, threatening to turn them all into goblins unless we, and I quote, give him the city. What are these terms? It's either deny your offer and let you take over the city by turning everyone into your goblin minions, or willingly give you the city and let you do the same thing anyway? You see the issue here? Anyway, before we deal with that, we gotta catch up with a certain science squid. Every level so far has had a particular theme to its design. The first level was a general introduction to the basics, naturally. The Rhino level was a chase sequence. Electro's level had a strong emphasis on platforming. Venom's level had a bunch of environmental hazards and chaos around you like symbiote goo, incoming trains, and a collapsing bridge. And Doc Ock's level has a bunch of intricate laser patterns that switch on the fly and keep you on your toes. I brought it up before, but this section where you run toward the camera and away from lasers is really cool, especially when you start grinding on poles. It's really easy to miss collectibles because of how fast paced this section is, but I'd be happy to replay it and pick up anything I missed. I think this is my favorite level of the bunch. It reminds me of how at the end of Never Saw Spider-Man you end up in this deep underground massive lab. I love this Doc Ock character model. The buff physique, the vibrant green suit, perfectly adapted from the Ultimate comics. I want to say that this is the only game where we get to fight this rendition of Otto. I love this vaguely German accent they give him. Is Otto supposed to be of German descent? He was born in Schenectady, New York, but I don't know, I feel like he often has an American German accent, if that makes sense. Fascinating, isn't it, Peter? Those idiots at Roxxon didn't realize that for a functioning Oz Venom synthesis, you need precisely tuned oscillating lasers. His boss fight has you focusing your attacks on his tentacles first to bring him down to ground level, while you'll then be able to do direct damage. With Otto all tied up, we then move on to... Whoa! Dude, finally! A Spider-Man game that includes my hometown borough, the Bronx! Shout out to you, Ultimate Spider-Man Total Mayhem! You just shot up to the top of my favorite Spidey games for this. Insomniac Spider-Man could never. Seriously, let's get more of the Bronx in Spider-Man games. New York City is more than just Manhattan, Queens, and, and Brooklyn. And you can leave Staten Island out. Ah, wouldn't you know it? A new enemy type. And no, those aren't goblin mutants that Norman created. That's just what people from the Bronx look like. We catch up to Norman in a very strange rendition of what I guess is supposed to be the Yankee Stadium with these extra floating platforms. And we go through a gauntlet of all the different enemy types we've come across. But the goblin gets away when he realizes that S.H.I.E.L.D. agents have been neutralizing his lackeys. This final level is really different from the rest. It's the only one that has an extensive web swing sequence, so it really makes it stand out. You'll have to do more than just simply press the jump button to web swing. At certain points, you'll need to web strike off of floating drones, otherwise you'll fall down to the streets and be forced to start from the last checkpoint. And these instances are treated like QTEs, you have to tap on the drone itself and because they won't always be placed in the same spot on your screen, you have to be locked in and react fast. It's engaging and it makes for an appropriately bombastic sequence for the climax of the game. The fight against the goblin is another one that's just fine. He throws fireballs at you and will occasionally create a grid of flames for you to avoid. No sweat. With all of Spidey's rogues rounded up, the S.H.I.E.L.D. boys mentioned that Dr. Connors will be working on a cure for the remaining symbiote-infected civilians. And that's another one in the books for the Web Slinger. But there is one villain left to take care of. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. Thank you, Spider-Man. You saved us. You're so not a freak, I swear. Ah, character development. As a reward for finishing the game, we unlock Ultimate Difficulty and get access to the Symbiote Soup. This is awesome, man! I wasn't expecting this. And it's more than just a simple skin swap. It has its own set of attacks that use the Symbiote Tendrils, and the special attack is totally different. It has Spider-Man repeatedly pounding the ground in a really aggressive manner. I know I'm sounding like a broken record here, but there was genuine effort poured into Ultimate Spider-Man Total Mayhem, and it sucks that it's no longer officially available. Obviously, there are certain ways to play it today like I did, 
But not everyone has access to a computer that can emulate these kinds of games. And even so, optimizing your computer to run them at the best possible settings can be a little intimidating to some people. I know the rights to comic book characters won't simply allow for something like this to happen, but man, it'd be awesome to get this in the PlayStation Store, eShop, or hell, even back on iOS and the Google Play Store for, I don't know, 10, 15 bucks? Because it deserves to have ease of access to. And I know there's a bunch of people who would enjoy this game. I certainly did. If you'd like me to cover more of these lost mobile games, let me know in the comments. I'm really curious to check out that Dark Knight Rises game. That's just so fascinating to me, given that the Arkham games were already well established at that point, so there's gotta be a bunch of inspiration from those games. Also, how does the TASM 2 mobile game stack up against the console one? Could be fun. Maybe we'll make that a thing. But until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Special thanks to Sam, Carlos Fontes, and Punk Samurai1985 for subscribing at the top tier. You guys are certified superheroes.